Well, if we had this information, our lives, our technology, our society may have developed much differently than it has without. We have found ourselves now on a path for the last 1700 years or so of asking ourselves to interpret the great changes in our world, the great challenges of our lives without context, without a frame of reference. And it's brought us to the point where we are today. Look how well we've done in understanding what's happening in our world without this ancient frame of reference. Scientists that I've dealt with, and I've worked in the world of science and engineering, aerospace, earth sciences, and when you use the word prophecy to a scientist or ancient predictions, while they may be interested, it doesn't mean a lot to them intellectually. It's almost considered in some instances to be a fantasy or a dream or something make-believe. Well, our own scientists now are validating phenomenon that are referenced in ancient traditions. They're phenomena for which we have no point of reference. They go beyond the boundaries of our Earth. 1998, in the prophecies of Edgar Cayce and of Nostradamus, and certainly of more recent ones, Gordon Michael Scallion, we mentioned earlier, falls well within, and in some cases, 1998 defines the beginning of a window of time where we may see the greatest changes, the greatest challenges ever recorded, ever experienced in recorded human history. Well, early in 1998, in the spring of 1998, now our own scientists began to measure changes that do not fall within the paradigm and the predictions of what Western technology says should be happening. Late 1997, there was an event that occurred and it was not reported until early 1998. Astronomers and astrophysicists measured an explosion that occurred on the boundaries of our known universe. This is a long, long way from Earth. Science News, the little journal that comes out weekly, documented that this explosion that occurred was of such massive proportions, it was second only to the Big Bang. The Big Bang is the explosion that many theorists and physicists believe began the universe as we know it today. From the soup of the nothingness, there was this primal explosion, and we are living the consequences of the Big Bang today. Well, the explosion that occurred in late 1997 wasn't reported until April of 1998. They said was second only to that Big Bang. It's the most massive event, celestial event, ever documented in recorded human history. And if it was second only to the Big Bang, and the Big Bang created this universe that we know now, then they're asking the question, is this a new universe that was birthed? Okay, that was early in 1998. Now, researchers have reported at least 2,000 additional explosions of at least the same magnitude on the edges of our known creation. 2,000 of what originally was the most outrageous celestial phenomena we could have ever imagined. Does that mean that 2,000 new universes have been created? Something is happening out there on the fringes of our known universe. Some theorists speculate that this dimensional expression is breaking up and birthing something new, starting from the fringes on the way out. I invite you to scan the tech journals and go into the Journal of Medicine, go into the, the Earth Science Journals. Science News is an excellent source. Every seven days they come up with a survey of all the things that are happening in layperson's terms, covering the broad spectrum of many different sciences, from physics to Earth science and space, mathematics. The point here is, when we share these phenomena with people in the small villages in Tibet and in the Andes Mountains in South America, along the Nile in Egypt and the villages there, their traditions not only allow for these kinds of changes, they predict that these things will happen and even more as Earth goes through this time in history. They expect this. They have a frame of reference. They have a context. We lost that context in the West. Why? When did it happen? How did it happen? Well, the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is share with you where those losses came from, what they may mean to us, and how our lives possibly could be different if we had them again today. 
1,700 years ago, huge portions of our most ancient heritage were relegated to the esoteric traditions, the mystery schools, and the sacred orders of their time. This occurred in the year 325 AD. In the year 325 AD, Constantine put together a council, it became known as the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century. And during that time, this council recommended that the redundant, mystical, loosely organized body of information that we now know as our Western Bible, that that body of information be made more concise. So the council sifted through all of this information, these many books and the texts. Some of them were not even bound. Some of them were just loose leaf collections on papyrus rolls. They discovered that some appeared so mystical that they didn't understand them. And they assumed that if they didn't, no one else in the future ever would, so they took them out. They assumed that some of the information was so empowering to the people of that time that it really didn't serve them, so they were removed. At least 25 books were taken from our biblical text. We'll explore these in just a few moments. By the recommendation of this council, additionally, 20 other supporting documents. Now, these weren't necessarily biblical texts. They were references that the biblical text would bring in every once in a while. So at least 45 books that I know of were taken from our history, and the ones that were left were rearranged and condensed into what we today call our Western biblical text. Among the books that were lost from our biblical texts, the Gospel of the Birth of Mary what a fascinating book. Now it has been recovered. It has been translated and is available in Western texts now. The Gospel of the Birth of Mary shows a story of the mother of Jesus of Nazareth and her mother. It shows that Mary, Jesus' mother, her mother was 81 years old when she gave birth to Mary and that she'd been barren all of her life. And that both Mary's mother and Mary were schooled in the esoteric traditions of the Essenes of which Jesus of Nazareth also became a master in the Essene traditions. The Infancy of the Life of Jesus. This is a fascinating book detailing a young prophet in the early years of his life coming to terms with the powers and the abilities that he's come into this world to explore. And what we're reminded of in this book is that every human comes into the world with these abilities and that we deny them and that we forget them early in our lives and live the consequences of that throughout life. The difference between us and Jesus at this time in his life is that he didn't forget. He was encouraged to develop and honor these abilities by parents who had been schooled in the traditions that supported these. The book of Nicodemus, the books of Barnabas, the letters of Herod and Pilate, for me, this is one of the most interesting, one of the most fascinating books that was taken out of our text because it gives a very different view of Pontius Pilate and King Herod at the time of the crucifixion. To paraphrase and to make a long story very short, essentially what these letters say, Pilate wrote to Herod immediately after the crucifixion and said, King Herod, I believe we just made a big mistake. Herod was trying to distance himself from the crucifixion. And he wrote back to Pilate and said, what do you mean we? He said, I didn't make the choice to crucify this man. The state of Rome had no interest in his crucifixion. That was done on a local level. And it's a very human insight into what these men went through, realizing what they had done and the role that they were about to play in history. It's a fascinating book. We lost that 1,700 years ago. The infancy of Jesus, as we witness him coming to terms with his power, he appears much more human, and we can relate to that in our humanness. Rather than believing that this man came in this world fully aware of his powers and just began going out and working with them. The book of the visions of the prophets, there's an entire book of visions, it's called the book of visions, that is filled with prophetic visions of what this time in history, our time, and they refer to it as the close of the cycle. In those days, these things will come about. These things will be known. And these are just some of the, the actual biblical books. The supporting texts are just as fascinating. There were books representing the 12 tribes 
of Israel. Each of them had their own book, the book of Levi, the book of Daniel. The books of Adam and Eve, there was the first and the second book of Adam and Eve giving tremendous insight into the seeding of their bodies and their consciousness into this world at this time in history. That was taken out. Perhaps one of the most telling is a book that is known as The Secrets of the Prophet Enoch. This is actually the supporting document, The Secrets of Enoch. This is different than the modern-day Keys of Enoch many people refer to, although the Keys of Enoch reference specific passages, and those passages became triggers for the author of the Keys of Enoch. This book is not actually the Keys of Enoch. 